Beautiful song. Inspiring words. We all need to ask the Lord to break us, to melt us and mold us, and also use us for His glory. Amen. This morning, uh, this noon, almost noon, it is a pleasure for me to to be back and also to be able to share the good news with you. Today also, I have a friend of a friend who is here from Palau, and it's a pleasure to, to know that the world is so small. Never knew that I would, you know, I would meet Nasser, who is my friend's friend, to come to my church on Sabbath. So, uh, many Welcome to YC, and I hope that you know you'll stay here with us as we all continue to serve our Lord and do what is right before Him. We have started a series almost two months now. It has we had a break because I was away, and we also had some very interesting sermons. It's about the armor of God. I hope you haven't forgotten what we have talked about so far. We started with the wiles of the devil. Satan has his methods of deception and he, he, he said us those things that we will stray away from God. We identify some of those and we move on to the belt of truth. What did we say? We said that it is important for Adventists or every Christian to do what? To fill his mind with you forgot? The truth. Very good. Fill his mind with truth so that we can now move on to the breastplate of righteousness, which is right doing. Once you know what is true, because you've been studying, you've been feeling the mind of truth, what do you do? You have to put that into practice. But the breastplate of, um, of righteousness, as you study, it is for us to obey the truth that we study from the heart. A lot of people know the truth. Some of them actually obey the truth, but they don't obey the truth from the heart. They do it because they have to. They do it because they are obligated to. But God wants us to obey Him from the heart. And that's where we start. Today, we're going to continue with the third piece of the arm. And let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 14. Ephesians 6, verse 14. Start from there. Are you there? The Bible says, Stand therefore, having burdened your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And having shown your feet with the preparation of the gospel of truth, of peace. Stand therefore, having put on your belt of truth, having also put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet 
with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Choose. Choose. I was thinking of truth, the story about truth, and it brought me to about two years ago. No, actually more than that. It was in 2004? 2008. December. That's about eight years ago. President Bush, what was it? He was having a press conference. And while he was speaking, something strange was thrown at him. What was it? Shoot. A shoe. How many? Two. Two. From a journalist. A journalist. And uh, what was the main thing? So the journalist, his name was Muntabar, Muntadar Al Zaidi, and he was an Iraqi. He was from Iraq. And he didn't actually, he was disapproving whatever Bush, uh, President Bush, did in Iraq. And to show him his disapproval, what did he do? He took off his shoes and threw it at him. And I was actually surprised and impressed by how the president was, you know, shifting, shifting, and you know, just getting away from the shoe. He was really directed at him. You can see it, but he had a good reflex, and he was not, he was not, you know, hit. And this is what he said afterward. He said, "All I can report is it." It was the size what? 10. I wonder how he could see it and know it was size 10. And when you think about that, that's, you know, some people, and I was told that in Iraq, or the Muslim, when somebody throws a shoe at you, it's the lowest um, insult that you can actually receive from someone. Um, I don't know if, while well, well, we grew up, you know, sometimes, when the parents are very angry, they just say anything that is allowed and they just throw it at you. But in this culture, when somebody throws a shoe at you, that means a person has insulted you and that's the worst. President Bush was not that, you know, um, hurt. He actually laughed afterward. Now, another story took me to the Philippines. And I had members here that have been bills just today. Someone, a Filipino, actually changed my mind a little bit about this story. But I'm going to tell you anyway. You've heard of President Marcos, right? He was, I would say, dictator, they say, um, in the Philippines. And when he was deposed, people went into the palace and they found his wives um, in the room. He opened the shelves. And they saw a lot of shoes. Do you know how many pairs of shoes they discovered? Anyone want to take a guess? 2,000? Yes, it's yes, about 2,000. But today I was told it was more than that. It was 3,000 something. But this is what was reported. Apart from the billions in six banks that they discovered in buildings in New York, etc. They found that 2,700 pairs of shoes. That's your goal. Now, I was told today that she never used all the shoes. In fact, the shoes that they found. This is what I was told today. That was, uh, she never actually liked those kind of shoes. But she had those pairs in her room, in her closet. And the person said, because she has this stuff, probably many people gave them to her, but she never displayed them. But the main thing for me was, I thought she had all those because she wanted to show up. Now, I was corrected today. I don't, I don't know if all Filipinos believe this because some people really display her or paint her as someone who misused the, you know, the resources of the country and bought so many shoes. And so, the 
there are people who show off with their shoes. I don't know if you come to church to show off your shoes, because some people do. I don't know if the male Bumpers was one of those, but the truth is she had many shoes. Now, what does a shoe is good for? What is it good for? Is this how do we wear shoes to throw at people? Or do we wear shoes to show up? Why do we wear these shoes? To? To protect the feet. The truth is, we wear shoes to walk on. Right? The question is, where and why? Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are ready to listen to you. To speak to us, transform us. Open our eyes that we may see Jesus and only Him. Open our ears that we may hear your word of truth. May that word be sweet to our ears and transform us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, 14 to 15 tells us. That apart from having the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, we ought to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When I looked into the word shod, it means to bind under our feet. To bind under our feet the gospel of peace. What does that mean? That means wherever you go, wherever you find yourself, this gospel of peace should go along with you. Are we together? And so we ought to shout to burn our feet with the gospel of peace. Now, in for some reason, my um, Turn with me to First Peter three fifteen. In First Peter three fifteen, we read this: "But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear." Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Wherever you go, you should have a message to say when everyone asks you, why do you have the hope that you have? Why do you do the things you do? You should be able to give it an answer. So sometimes we go places. We work in places. But we never go with the gospel of peace. In fact, we just want to have that no one asks us about our faith. The Lord says we should be ready. We should be able to answer people with meekness and fear. Isaiah 52 7 says, How beautiful, listen to this, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings what? Good news. Who proclaims peace. Who brings glad tidings of good things. Who proclaims salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. How many of us have this gospel of peace? This good news that we share everywhere we go. How many of us actually understand and believe that we do have a good news to tell others? Last week, we were reminded that we cannot use the truth 
unless we use it in the context of salvation. Are you saved today? Let me ask you that question today. Are you confident that you're saved? Because if you're not confident, how can you tell others that Christ saves? But what is interesting is the, the, the feet, the Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of the one that brings this good news to others. And many times we appeal on the, you know, on the pulpit for us to go out, preach this good news, and bring others to Christ. But many times we fail to see people embracing that call. One reason is because we do not believe in the truth we have. We do not believe in this good news of salvation. Probably because we are not sure that we are saved ourselves. What is gospel? What does it mean? Mean gospel. Good news. The gospel means good news. Good tidings in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. We just read it a while ago. But what does it mean, the word peace? Peace. The word peace in Hebrew means shalom. You've heard that you know, many times, um, songs with the word shalom. But what is interesting about this word is that in the strong concordance, it means oneness, rest, to join, to set at one again. Let me go again. The word peace means oneness, rest, to join again, and also to set at one again. Now, if you think about this, who were we at peace with when the world began? Who were we at peace with when everything began? With? With God. We were at peace with Him because we, Adam and Eve, were obeying God to get that peace. Failed, I would say, eternal. Why? Because Adam disobeyed. And so, in Ephesians, in Ephesians 6, 14, 15, God is saying we should shut our feet to the preparation of the gospel of peace. But then, in Isaiah 27, 5, listen to what the Bible says. It says, Or oh, let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me. And he shall make peace with me. God wants us to make peace with him once again. The whole gospel is about humanity making peace with God. Joining with God again. And that's why when we think of the atonement message, Revelation, you know, uh, 14, 6 through 12, the three angels' messages, it talks about the good news of salvation, but also talks about this gospel of peace. And I want us to go quickly and read the three angels' message. Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 7 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Sing with a loud voice, Hear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Continuing, another angel followed, saying, 
Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Continues and says, Then a third angel, verse 9, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the land. And the smoke of his torments are sent forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives. The mark of his name. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is a message we have to preach to all nations. Now, while Satan, while Satan, and his agents are preaching and preparing and making war with God's people. What's happening? We should be making sure that we make peace with Jesus. Notice here, God is at war with someone here. And Satan also is at war with God's people. Now, while they are preparing to make war with God's children, what are we supposed to do? Preparing ourselves to make peace with God. We're not supposed to prepare ourselves to fight them back, but we are supposed to be making peace with Jesus. And this is what many of us we are not able to get in grasp because this is very important. And this message is found in the sanctuary doctrine. The sanctuary message tells us that once a year, I've talked about this over and over, once a year, what happens? The high priest makes atonement on behalf of all the Israelites. And we call that day the day of atonement. Think about it. Atonement. At one minute. At one with God. One day of the, a year, God reconciles a whole nation unto himself. That day, everyone is to be one. Yes, it was a time of searching deep within himself, sin, transgression, but it was also a time to hope that at the end of this, we shall be one with God. It was, yes, a time that some people would worry about if they were saved or not, but it was a time to know for sure that if the high priest comes out of that tabernacle, that most holy place, and he had confessed all my sins, there was assurance that I will be okay. And so the question is, how many of us understand this message of atonement this day of atonement, which reminds us that we ought to make peace with Christ. Because once he gets out of that most holy place, it's war. It's war with whoever did not make peace with him. And so, it is important for us to understand that proclaiming the gospel of peace 
is proclaiming making peace with Christ. Now, some people understand peace as just a matter of being in the world with no problem. Peace is, we should seek for a world with peace, where there is no terrorism, there is no you know, noise of war, there is no conflict. But understand the scriptures. Do you think we're going to get to a point where we have the peace that people talk about? Yes or no? Some people don't want to hear this, but that's the truth. Peace that people call and claim is not the peace God is talking about. Now, let's go to First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 3. I'll bring the Bible to First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 1 through 3. It's on the screen, but I want you to read it from your Bibles. Amen? You there? But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Verse 3. For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon the pregnant woman, and they shall not what? Escape. As the world cries out and preach peace and safety, the Bible says sudden destruction comes upon them. And they shall not escape. What's wrong with this text? The gospel of peace is to be preached to everyone. Peace, right? How come people are preaching and saying peace and safety, yet destruction is a result of what they preach? What's wrong with that? Did you get it? Can you see it? While some people are making peace with God, what's happening? Other people are making peace with who? With the devil. And they are crying peace and safety. Come together. Let's go together. Let's have peace. And while they join together, the Bible says, as the sinners, sudden destruction comes upon them. Now, these people are not making peace with Christ. Because if they were making peace with Christ, the result would not be destruction, but the last life. Amen? So, primarily, the world believes that there is one person that can lead the whole world into perfect peace. Do you know? The world today believes that there is one person, he has proven to be very good at negotiating treaties and ceasefire here and there. And they believe that with this person, the world can come to perfect peace. It is not personal about Who is it? The Pope Francis. Pope Francis said a month ago that the world is at war. Hmm. Why is he saying this? Um, July 27, it says, in a brief address aboard, the people claim a route to Krakow for World Youth Day. Pope Francis expressed his conviction that the world is at war, but it is not a religious war. Since every religion 
wants what? Peace. So Islam also wants peace. Christianity wants peace. Buddhism wants peace. So all the religions want peace. So this war is not about a religious war. He goes on and says, um, the Pope told God is traveling with him that the world is not only insecure, it is at war. But it is a real war, not a religious war. It's a war of interest, a war for money, a war for natural resources, and for the dominion of the peoples. That's what he's saying. For well, some that might say it's a religious war. Every religion wants peace. The war is wanted by the other, but the others are pursued. Said the Pope. If all the other religions want peace, they will join together to have that peace. It is not a peace to do according to God's will. But it is a peace to just come together, put aside differences, and join a common understanding of truth. And that's the peace we're talking about. But, interestingly speaking, Shimon Peres, he said this on the, in the book in 2014, he said, Francis is a more powerful peace advocate than the UN. have a conflict, the Pope has enough power to make it work. They need to work between um, Cuba and America, and other conflicts in the world, he is fixing those problems because he has that power. Now, understand this, as the world and all the regions are gathered together seeking peace, safety, with the Pope leading us, we have to remember that the peace Christ is talking about is not a peace to join with other religions, forego all the things that we do believe is true, and join on common points. But He wants us to be making one, becoming one with Jesus. And then, what was the message of John the Baptist? What was his message? John the Baptist preached the gospel of peace. But it was not peace that the world preaches today. In fact, Jesus Christ also preached the same, the same gospel. Now, in Luke 1, 76, 79, it says, A new child will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of what? Peace. John the Baptist preached peace. Even though he was a prophet that was not popular because of what he was preaching, he was all about becoming one with God. Becoming one with Christ. And Jesus Christ preached the same message in Acts 10, 36, verse 38, it is told it is us here that preaching peace through Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ said also in the Bible that he did not come to bring peace. The peace that the world is given. But he came to do what? To cut it, to, you know, to separate. You have to make a choice whether you want to make peace with the world or you want to make peace with God. You can't have both. 
And who needs to bring that peace to the people? In Romans chapter 10, I'm going to read from verse 13. It won't be on the screen. So open your Bibles. Romans 10, 13 through 17 tells us this. Very important. Romans 10, 13 through 17. It says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Gospel of peace. All of them have obeyed it. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Brothers and sisters, how then the people of Okinawa will believe in God if they haven't heard the gospel? How then will they call upon him if they haven't heard of Jesus? You can't believe something you don't know. And this is our mission. To go out there and let people know that there is salvation in Jesus. Amen? And once they, do, they, they hear it and believe it, then they can You think the pastor is the only preacher to bring that news? No. All of us are supposed to be preachers of this gospel of peace. Peace with Christ, not with the world. And Jesus Christ preached this. Unfortunately, not everybody believed him. Even the rulers. Even the rulers. John 12, 37, 38 says this, But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. He says, Lord, who has believed our report? Who has believed our preaching? And yes, sometimes I feel the same. You preach week after week and you ask yourself, how many people believe this Gospel. Jesus himself preached this gospel. And, and did so many things. He says, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded the eyes. And harden their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Brothers and sisters, this gospel of peace can be preached over and over, and some of you may not know. Why? Because God has blinded you. But you refuse to listen, you refuse to change, you refuse to believe it. The rulers of those days, the Pharisees, Sadducees, after the law, did not believe Christ. Why? Some of them believed him. The things he did, they knew he was. Not a common person. But they decided, they chose not to confess him. Why? 
The kids symbolizes of coming together. This is another you know verse, but I'm not gonna get there today. But let's continue. So humble yourselves, becoming one with Christ, she became his friend. Another proof that she was one with him because she anointed his head. So many things to say. But before this sin ended, Jesus said this in verse 27, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are coming, many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the sin loves little. Do you think you are the worst sinner? Look at Mary. How many spirits the Bible says she chose to save it? Seven. Well, I don't know if it's literal, but seven is, is you know, a symbol of completeness. She was fully a sinner. And Christ declared her, what? Forbidden. And because he knows, when you understand that you're a sinner, and God has Cleanse you from all that. You will love him more. But when you think you you are okay, you are not as bad as that one. You don't know what the Lord has done for you. And to end it, Jesus continues said, He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Do what? Go in peace. Christ wants to do the same thing. For you and for me too. Christ wants to tell us your sins are forgiven. You don't have to worry whether you're sick or not. Go in peace. We like to leave this church today believing that your sins are forgiven and that you have surrendered not some but everything to God. So that God, Jesus can tell us, Messer, go in peace. Sin, go in peace. Marco, chill, go in peace. We are here. We are Your decision today and every other day determines who you are more. Will it be Satan or will it be God? I have decided, no matter what, that I choose to be at war with the world. They can call me all names. I don't care. But be at peace with my Lord Jesus. And be at peace with my Lord Jesus comes with humbling myself. Surrendering every known sin to Him. Anointing His hands and kissing His feet. Asking for forgiveness. Are you willing to do that? Because I know once I surrender all, oh, He will forgive me. And I can go out, preach this gospel to those who are doubtful. They don't know whether they're saved or not. Asking the question, am I saved? God cannot forgive me. I've done so many bad things. Right here, I see that Jesus is willing to forgive even the worst sinner. By putting on this gospel of truth, preaching this gospel of peace, it took me to this statistics of Japan in the conference. Look at it. 2010 through 14, what's going on? Membership is going down. Year after year, there is no growth in this Japan. And this is the conference that hosts us. Yes, you may think you are a foreigner, that this is, has nothing to do with you. But I want to 
tell you that God brought you here to do something. Look at that. Churches from 115 to 102. Decline. And it's continuing. Churches have turned into companies now because the members are decreasing. They are too old, dying. What do we do? Oh, I see it. Yes, you look at you know, the pews and you think, wow, we're doing well. Look at it. In 2014, minus negative 0.06. And this, God wants us to do something. I believe it. The reason that we have this series coming up in October, and every one of us is invited to do something, to bring one soul to the Lord. But first, we have to have the assurance that we are saved. We have to have the assurance that we can go to peace. Would you like to give the same message to other people out there? How about my friends in Japanese? Do you see this need to tell your Japanese also friends that Jesus saves? We can preach about it. But unless we start to put this in practice and live it, nothing's going to happen. Sorry if I've taken the time, but it is something that we need as Christians to know that there is hope in the Lord. And as Mary was transformed, as Mary was sent with joy and peace, the Lord is saying us today, joy and peace. Don't worry about the past. Look forward. Because the Lord is here. He's a lot of fun, but it's a lot.